Hey TYT, I'm Nomi Kantz. We're here at the PCCC Candidates Training in Washington, D.C., where progressives from all over the country have come together who are interested in running for office, are running for office, may actually be in office, and, and want to learn how to be the best candidate in 2017 and beyond, especially with such a climate of so many progressives who are interested in, in running and taking on the Trump administration and, and some of the Democratic establishment. We have a candidate right now who made a name for himself in New Jersey. Uh, he is running for for the 4th District in New Jersey, the Congressional District, uh, Jim Keedy. And uh, you've got a great story. How, how does everybody know who you are, if they, if they remember your name? So most people in the political scene in New Jersey know me as the guy that Governor Christie screamed at. What people don't know about me is how I got to that point where I was standing up uh, to the governor on behalf of 14,500 families that were not yet back home two years after the storm. You know, I jokingly tell people that I'm an accidental activist. You know, I grew up in Belmar, New Jersey, which was a town where I challenged the governor, and you know, I had a pretty normal middle class, upper middle class life. I, I you know, went to St. Rose Grammar School, then Christian Brothers Academy. I was an athlete. I won a scholarship to St. Joe's University to play soccer. I uh, was lucky enough after I finished my undergrad degree to take off and backpack around the world. And some of the seeds that had been planted in me by the Sisters of St. Joseph and the Christian Brothers and then the Jesuits were to serve people. Uh, so I ended up working with Mother Teresa's Missionaries of Charity in a couple of different countries. And I came back from that trip and, and really wanted to make a, a difference. I wasn't sure how to do it. Uh, I fell into a teaching job. I was a high school religion teacher uh, at St. Rose, which is in the district where I'm currently running and where I grew up. And I, my night job, I was playing minor league professional soccer. And one of the guys that I played with was a head coach at St. John's University in New York City. And at the time, St. John's was the NCAA Division I defending national champions, the best team in the country. And this guy offers me a job to join his coaching staff. And I jumped on it. And I went up to St. John's and I was coaching with the best team in the nation, and I'm also doing a graduate degree in theology. I was a religion teacher, and my students had great questions. I have good enough answers for them, so I wanted to go back and learn more. And in my first class, Moral Person, Moral Society, I start writing a paper topic about Nike's labor practices in light of what's called Catholic social teaching. And what I found was if you wanted to pick a company that violated everything that we claim to stand for, Nike was a perfect case study. At the same time I'm learning this about Nike, St. John's University Athletic Department starts negotiating a $3.5 million endorsement contract that part of the deal I would have to wear and promote Nike products. I tried to negotiate myself out of the deal for a year behind the scenes. Eventually I took a stand and I said I cannot be a walking advertisement for a company that's exploiting poor people around the world. And I was given an ultimatum by my head coach, you wear Nike and drop this or get out. I held my ground. I became the first athlete in the world to say no to Nike because of the sweatshop issue. I was forced out of my job. That was big news. I filed a lawsuit against St. John's and Nike. I came out of the courthouse and there's ABC, NBC, Fox. I'm on ESPN, HBO Sports. I started getting, getting invited around the country. And this is when that issue was first exploding into the consciousness of Americans. And I was this instant expert. And I'm speaking at universities, and the market fundamentalists in the audience are screaming at me, you don't know what you're talking about, those are great jobs for those poor people, and what else would they be doing, and the wages are good there. I knew they were wrong for my research. The competitive athlete in me wanted to prove my critics wrong. So in the summer of 2000, I moved to Indonesia, and I went to go live in a Nike factory worker slum and tried to survive on their sweatshop wage. At the time, it was $1.25 a day. And, and how did you survive of $1.25 a day? Was so, it a good job? It absolutely was not. In one month, trying to live in a Nike sweatshop wage, I lost 25 pounds. I slept on a cement floor in a slum that was surrounded by open sores, dealing with the rats and the cockroaches. And I met the mostly young women who made the stuff that I wore as an athlete for my entire life. And I never thought twice about who they were and what their lives were like. And I promised them, I'll go home, I'll tell your stories, I'll advocate for you. And I thought I was going to do that for six or seven weeks. When I got back from that trip, I was on the road for seven months. I spoke at more than 80 schools. I then started a nonprofit organization because I saw people that are hungering for this kind of grassroots education and political advocacy. 
and I've done the program at more than 500 schools in 44 different states and three different countries. I've been brought here to Capitol Hill to brief members of Congress on the issue. When the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership deal was being kicked around, uh, I partnered up with a staffer in uh, Senator Sanders' office, did a clandestine mission over to Vietnam, met with Nike workers in the underground labor movement and democracy movement there to tell them the other side of the story that they weren't getting from our State Department from the Obama administration, uh, and also to bring their stories back about what their concerns were. It was brought down to D.C. again to brief the Senate Finance Committee on this issue, and over this, you know, 20-year arc of dealing with that Nike sweatshop issue, that was the one that really opened my eyes, that people need strong advocates and strong voices. So when I'm here in the United States and talking about fair wages, a fair day's pay for a fair day's work, making sure that we have a collective voice at the workplace, I know what the extreme is. I lived it. I sat with folks that had no voice. And this is why it's so important right now in this era of Trump and what the Republicans are trying to do here in Washington, D.C., to have really powerful, strong voices on the floor of the House of Representatives and the Senate to stand up for those things, those values that we hold so dear as progressives. So I've been engaged both on issue-oriented politics and electoral politics for the last 20 years of my life. I've served in local office in New Jersey, had an unsuccessful run for the State Assembly in 2015, right after the sit-down-and-shut-up moment. Uh, and I've been involved in a range of campaigns, whether it's the Nike factory workers campaign or uh, in 2015-16, I was in the front lines of the Syrian refugee crisis, helping refugees come across the Aegean Sea from Turkey and into Greece and getting them settled. I've worked on local campaigns. When I was a councilman in Asbury Park, it was a majority minority city. Uh, we had 30% of our people below the poverty line, 20% just above it. We had gangs and guns and unaffordable housing and not enough good paying jobs. So I. All of these experiences I've, ha I've had in, this last, in the last two decades have put me on this trajectory where now I feel ready that I want to go in and I want to fight for not just the people of the 4th District, but a congressperson, because a congressperson isn't just making policies for their district. Certainly we have to bring our voice and our values from our home districts, but we're fighting for the people in New Jersey and the people of the United States. You know, you, you bring a tremendous amount of experience, world experience, global experience, which really does come down to local, especially when it comes to issues like TPP, which many say was an issue that our party, the Democratic Party, could have lost the election on. When you look at the polling in states like Ohio and in Pennsylvania and in Wisconsin and in Michigan, and you see the white working class voters and how Donald Trump ran against TPP, as did Bernie Sanders, and those voters crossed over. And those are the voters that, in the end, turned the election for Hillary Clinton, you did not get her over the, the limit. You had uh, Tim Kaine, who was one of the major proponents of TPP, and, and it, it, was, it, it was one of those issues that has kind of represented the dynamics, the split in the Democratic Party. With that being said, you are running in New Jersey. And for those of you who are not aware, New Jersey, it's hard for me to say this as a New Yorker who covers New York politics. I think that New Jersey has a more entrenched political establishment than New York, and that's really hard to do. Um, how are you as a progressive, as somebody who does have a lot of understanding of these economic issues, which usually when a candidate understands economics, the establishment is like, oh, get away from us because you're going to challenge our, our fundamental sense of being. How are you maneuvering all that? I mean, you have been elected before, but like, are they welcoming you? Are they embracing you? Uh, do you have to win them over? Like, what are the dynamics, especially because so many people who want to run for office have to maneuver this landscape? What are you doing? What can they learn from you? Well, I think the one thing that I would say to anybody who's just getting involved in politics now, the, like the blinders came off after the November election, and they're very excited and they're passionate, you have to stick with it, especially in a state like New Jersey. Uh, people jokingly say in New Jersey, you, you run to lose so you can win. <laughs> right? So you, you really have to stay with it. And I, I use, you know, I, I've been able to, to garner this experience from my work on the Nike sweatshop issue. So when I first took that issue on, one of the things that I was pushing for was for universities to cut their contracts with Nike because of the sweatshop issue, right? It's just started to happen. Six schools have done it in the last year. That's 20 years after I first started pushing on that. So that's the kind of vision I have, whether it's at the, uh, the local level in my community in New Jersey or at the state level, or at the federal level. We, as bold progressive Democrats, have to have a 20-year vision 
I know we're in dire times right now, and we've got to send people into the breach to go fight against Trump and the, the Republicans that the the Republicans who have zero common sense and don't care about the people of this country and only care about their ideology, yeah, we got to get in there and fight them. And I, that's one of the reasons why I, I do want to be on the floor of the House of Representatives to get in that fight. But for people that are just getting engaged right now, it's we've got to have the long view. So you, you really have to stay in it. Do I have to win over people in the party establishment at the county level and the state level in New Jersey? Absolutely. And I'm winning them over by saying, I'm not going anywhere, right? I am committed to this. I am unapologetically bold and progressive. I think the values that we stand for as Democrats, we can't, you know, soften them. They cannot be Republican light. We saw what happened, I believe, my analysis, with, you know, John Ossoff's race down in Georgia. We threw the entire weight of the party behind it. We put all the, you know, 25, 26 million dollars into that race and we lost. And I look at other special elections that were around that same time where people were running on bold progressive agendas and they didn't have the weight of the party, they didn't have those kind of resources, and they closed greater gaps in terms of the last election cycles and how big Republicans had won in those other districts. So, um, you know, again, coming back to your question, what do we say to the new folks that are involved? Stay with it, all right? We're in this for the long haul. Do not compromise your values, and people will, over time, will respect that. I have guys that I grew up with who lean more to the right, maybe they're unaffiliated to the Republicans, and they'll say, Jim, I don't agree with half the stuff that comes out of your mouth, but I know you're honest, I know you will stand for what you believe in, and I know what I'm getting with you, right? So that's what I try to do. Jim. Best of luck. Thanks, I appreciate it. When's the that. election? When's the prime? Do you have a primary? Primary will be in June of next year. General election will be in November of 2018. If people want to learn more about my campaign, they can go to jimkeady.com. It's J-I-M-K-E-A-D-Y.com. You can follow me on Twitter at J-W-Keady, on Instagram at J-W-Keady, and on Facebook, Keady for Congress. And I would love to hear, I, I can tell you this. I will need the support of progressives from around the United States to start to elevate and lift my campaign up because where I live uh, hasn't been a, a bastion of activism or progressivism. Uh, we're getting there, but this is where I need help. And I am asking the progressive community in the United States, you want a bare knuckles Irish Catholic fighter to go in and fight against these Republicans? I need you to help me to get there. I think we're hearing you. All right. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. You got it. Take care.